Okay, it seems you're working. Uh, okay, so if, you, if it's beneficial for you, whether something was positive or negative, or what the infective agent was, so we would be able to treat it effectively. My next question is, in healthcare, do you think you have one infective agent or there might be more? Um, yeah, so please remember your patients can have ticks and fleas, all right, and scabies. So it's, I'm using that figuratively. So make sure that you realize that it's not gonna be one causative agent. At the end of the course, we'll go over an enteral bacteriaceae. We'll be looking at all the micro, um, microbes in your digestive tract, all right? And there's probably more than 12 or 15. And everyone today brushed their teeth at some point? Okay, so how many different uh, species of strap do you think you have on your teeth? 22. That's a low number, but yeah, probably hundreds of different. Today we're gonna see a little film on, does anyone know what a biofilm is? We're gonna see a little bit uh, animation on biofilm. We'll go over some of that stuff. So I kind of want to go over the steps in taking a sample. So whether we're looking at a wound, uh, why would we take a urine culture? Yeah, so a UTI, all right? So we can figure out a UTI, what's causing that. It could be E. coli, Klebsiella. Usually it's something from the digestive tract that's in the wrong place. So remember last week I said, Bacteria is fine if it stays where it belongs, but the minute it goes somewhere where it doesn't belong, it starts causing some major problems. So we kind of want to go into um, grabbing the specimen. We want to incubate it, you know, put a nice little warm womb. We have a couple back here. Keep it at a certain temperature to grow. And what temperature do you think the incubator's at, roughly? I don't know, Dr. Bill, probably body temperature. Yeah, body temperature, so around 37 degrees. We want to keep it um, culturally around body temperature. We're going to be growing organisms that would be um, effective for us. Remember I was talking about archaea and some of those bacteria. They're out there, but you're not going to see them in healthcare. Right? The object of the course for me is when you leave the course, you have an idea. When you go to read a report or patient file, you have an idea of what they're talking about. Okay, so we're going to go through the steps of uh, inoculating something, growing it. We're gonna isolate it, do it, we're gonna inspect it, we're going to figure out what it is, and then we're gonna, at the end of the course, we're gonna do some testing on different bacteria, and you're gonna use some disinfectants or antimicrobials and figure out which one has the biggest zone of inhibition. So we're gonna put the bacteria on a plate, we're gonna take each disc, we're gonna soak it in a certain disinfectant where we use an antibiotic disc, We'll place it on that plate and we'll come back a week later and see which one has the biggest zone of inhibition. So which antibiotic inhibited the bacteria the best? And that would be the one that you would prescribe, possibly. All right. But if it's something very, very toxic or your patient is allergic to it, we're going to pick something that's almost as effective, but maybe the least um, or less toxic for the patient, whether they're uh, pregnant or they have other underlying conditions. Right? So we're gonna identify it, incubate it, isolate it, inspect it, and then figure out, get this information, figure out how we're going to treat it. Right? I'm playing with the idea of doing a urine lab in here. I'll take some different vials and I'll put different bacteria in it and some fun stuff, it'll all be fake. And then it'll be an unknown and then you can Grab it, you can stain it and tell me gram positive, gram negative, rod, what is it, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacteria, CA, or something like that. So we'll kind of make it um, sort of real life-ish if possible. All right, I'm gonna skip through some of these slides. This should be uploaded on Brightspace. If you missed it or you wanna go back. And you guys, I didn't give you this PowerPoint, huh? Yeah, it's still this one. I gave you that one, and the one I gave you today, okay. So 
right, so I'm going to go over some just real basic things about the microscope. We'll go into a little bit more detail in lab. I'll actually pull out microscopes. We'll go over all the parts. I'm hoping you are semi-familiar with the microscope. If not, we'll review it. On your lab practical, I will literally have a microscope probably over here with parts labeled. So just tell me, it's the ocular, it's the objective, it's the stage, what does it do? So it should be easy, easy, easy points for you. Yeah, of course. You did upload a packet. It was a chapter three microscope packet. Are we supposed to print that out and you can see that? No, I just put it there in case you didn't get the handout or you want to go and review it if okay. you're looking on your device okay. or whatever. All right, so magnification is the ability to enlarge objects. All right, anyone who's taken um, anatomy or whatever before, what's the uh, most magnification we get on a microscope? Or how would you figure it out? If I ask you in the future, how do you figure out what total magnification you have? Eyepiece ocular times the objective. All right. So all the eyepieces here are 10x. All right. The largest magnification we have here is oil immersion, which is 100. So when I went to Kenmore West back in 1981, uh, 10 times 100 was 1,000. There are some microscopes that have a 20x ocular so they could potentially be 2,000. Right. For here, it's gonna be a basic light microscope, that's all we use, and we're gonna be using oil immersion for bacteria only. In lab, if you're looking at plants or whatever, you really don't need to go under oil immersion. You want oil immersion to give you the most magnification. All right. And resolving power is the ability to show detail. So we can magnify something all we want. If we can't resolve it, it doesn't do us any good. So everyone here has had an eye exam before? Okay, a real one? Okay. So what do they what do they have you read? That Snellen chart? And then they have you read it and they give you check out your resolving power. What is your prescription? Okay. Very similar to that. So the extent of enlargement is the magnification. And for anything eukaryotic or plants, we really don't need to go into that much detail. Right. They're going to talk here in a minute about wavelength that has the biggest thing to do with magnification. Right. So there's just a basic microscope. Um, this PowerPoint's probably about 10 years old, and we actually do have these microscopes here. Right. We also have the newer Lycras, and I said last week, please do not drop them. They're about $3,000 a piece, and they are brand new. So on your practical, I'll just, I'll label something, stage, coarse, fine focus, whatever it happens to be. When we get to lab, once you bring something into focus, all right, this is the coarse knob, you're never gonna touch that again. You should only touch the fine focus as you click the lenses in. If you, ha if you have to go and use that, there's something wrong with the microscope, just let me know and I will fix it. I'll take it apart and I'll uh, take it and fix whatever uh, has to be tuned up on it. All right. So they could ask you a question in your future about the objective lens forms the magnified real image. So when I say objective lens, when, how do you think they come up with that name? Because it's next to the object, the objective, all right? And the eyepiece or ocular is where you put your eye in. By the way, before I forget, um, whether Anyone who has false eyelashes in here? These are called Demodex, and they love to live in your eyelashes, all right? They love to eat the glue that holds your eyelashes on. So I bring that up because if you go to use a microscope, there are alcohol wipes, please wipe the ocular off, all right? I say that because two years ago, I went in for my eye exam, and the doctor said, uh, Phil, you have Demodex in your eyelashes. I go, what the hell are you talking about? And he showed me a picture. He goes, yeah, those are living in your eyelashes. They itch like crazy. It came out with tea oil, but it was shocking. Especially because I'm an optician and I've never heard of it before. I'm like, what? So please wipe the oculars off in case there's any critters living in there. Are your real images projected into the ocular? 
where he's magnified into a virtual image. So just realize your image gets flipped. So when you go to do your lab, it's gonna say, if I move the stage right, what do you think happens to your image? It moves left. If you move the stage away, the image moves towards you. So if they ask you a question like that, you, you should know that. Or if you don't, you forgot, which you can go over it again. Right. Total magnification again, if they ever ask you, is your, uh, I like to go ocular times objective, it doesn't matter. It's objective towards ocular, ocular towards uh, objective, that's your total magnification. So if I come over to you say, Dr. Phil, I can't find this image, it won't come in, the bacteria won't behave, it won't, you know, it won't stay still, or I can't find it, I'm gonna say what magnification are you on? And if you're on oil immersion and you didn't bring it into focus prior to that, well, good luck. So I'll go over the steps and how you do it. You go into your high and dry, 4X, uh, 40X, or 10X, 40X, and 100X, to do it in that order. Right, so this is basically just showing you your resolution. Right, so if they ever ask you, resolution of resolving power is the most important thing. Like I said, you can magnify something as much as you want. If you can't resolve and find the detail, it's pointless. When you get into oil immersion with bacteria, you want to be able to see the shape of the bacteria. Is it a coxide? Is it a rod? Gram positive or gram negative? And we'll go over that in lab. So don't panic about that. The other thing they love to ask you is, your resolving power is your wavelength of light times the number of aperture of the objective light, right? So is everyone sort of familiar with the photographic curve? This is visible light, goes from 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers, ultraviolet light, and then so on. So if they ever ask you, really, your resolving power just has to do with your wavelength and the numerical aperture of the objective light. Okay. When you look at your microscope and lab, I'll come around and show you, as you click into the different powers, underneath that, there'll be an aperture that you can change on that, and it'll tell you 40X, 100X, or whatever, you slide that over. So you can uh, close the aperture and give you more resolving power. And I'll show it to you if you're not familiar with it. Not a big deal. Okay. Oil immersion objective resolution is 0.2 nanometers. It's the most important. And magnification is between 40 and 2000X if we had a 20X oscillating in the time. So for us, it's 40X, times, um, or 40x to 1,000. Okay, I will give all of you a question like this on your exam. You won't get the exact same question, but this will be on your exam, so pay attention. <clears throat> Why do you use oil for oil immersion? The answer is, if you don't use oil immersion, the light rays here diffract, things are not clear. With oil immersion, it has um, the same, geometric axis is down right now, but it has the same, um, whatever, it's the same as air. It sends the light up through here, it bends it, sends it straight up to give you a clear image. So please don't tell me that the oil immersion increases magnification, it does not. It just fills in this gap so that when white rays come up, they don't diffract, they, they bend and they go straight up. Very similar to anyone who's wearing glasses or contacts. The reason you do that is you, you change the light coming in with contacts, you change the curvature of the cornea, so light coming in focuses on your retina. Same thing as oil immersion. Right? If you forget, I literally took that picture, made copies of it, it's literally on the microscope cabinet. Just to remind you, that's why it's there. Okay. So this is really telling you resolving power, and not a big deal, but if you look, these are a little bit harder to differentiate. With here, we can resolve these are two separate images. Okay. Does anybody here have trouble night driving? A little bit more difficult? And then let's make it dim, and let's throw a little rain so the street's wet. All right, so your resolving power goes way down, so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So 
For here, all we're going to be using is bright field. Most widely used specimen is darker than surrounding field. Used for live and preserved stained specimens. Here, all right, we're only using one type of microscope. I'm pretty sure, like I said last week, I'm pretty sure North has an electron microscope if you ever want to go over there. I don't know where it is, but I think it's in biotech. So dark field, don't worry about this. I won't test you on it, but you have seen this in case it pops up on the exam after you leave here on one of your NCLEX or MCAT exams or whatever they ask you. Phase contrast, if you look, that gives you a much better 3D picture of what's going on in there. And last week I said, if you look at bacteria, what don't they have? They don't have organelles, all right? So you're gonna be able to just see the basic outline shape of it. You can't really see the inside of it. You can't see any of the things inside the bacteria. Ribosomes or anything like that. Fluorescent microscope, you'll see a lot of pictures of this in Polaro or um, Bauman. Just showing you uh, how we can use dyes to really let us see that. So just saying with this, can you at least see the different shapes of the bacteria. All right, so we can all sort of agree these are circles, sort of. I'm gonna call them cocci from now on. No, you can't see that? No? <laughs> these are a little bit of rods, so you can just see the different shapes of the bacteria. Useful in diagnosing infections, we can tell for sure. That's a strep, that's definitely strep, all right? And that's probably, I would say, I'm mean, gonna guess that's E. coli, just by the shape of it. There's a scanning console microscope. So this kind of bounces off um, the object, sort of like, do you guys know how sonar works? Kind of bounce things off, give an idea. Similar to that. Okay. And then if they ever ask you, the most resolving power is electron microscope, because we change the wavelength. So magnification is between 5,000 and a million. So much, much better. All right, and there's scanning electron microscope. This gives you really good, super cool details. All right, you guys probably don't think that's exciting, but I nerd it out, I love this stuff. Okay, so let's get to something that's actually fun. All right, so wet mounts and hanging drop mounts. We can do these if anyone wants to do them. I don't because we're not gonna be looking at um, pond water and things like that. We could, but for here, I'm gonna focus on things that are microscopic that you're gonna see in healthcare. So wet mounts and hanging drop mounts also examine the characters of live cells. So we can just put a drop of water on a microscope in a well, we can turn it upside down, let it hang there, and you can look at it if you want to see something moving. If you want to do that, we can do that. Or bring in pond water, bring in something from your aquarium. We can definitely do that if you want. All right, we're going to be doing a lot of fixed mounts. So uh, did everyone sort of bring in a plate today? Or if you forgot, I'll give you another one. You can bring it in. Did anyone have something not grow or have nothing on there? It doesn't matter. So we're gonna, if you want, we'll take whatever you brought in and we'll put it on slides where he fix it. We can stain it and take a look at it. Right. Uh, somebody had some um, mold on the plate. So it's gonna be really, really large and full of nitrogen, so it'll be easy to see. Right. If you have some bacteria, it can be a little bit harder to see. We'll do that quickly tonight. The weather holds up for us. All right, so the smear is stained using dyes from the uh, visualization of cells or cell parts. All right, so initially when uh, I taught the course, uh, Dr. Lowe told me, she's like, well, here's some slides, will he fix them? Have the students look at them, they were not stained. So how do you think that went after about an hour in lab? I was ready for a drink because I couldn't even find stuff on there. So for us, we're gonna stain it today with a simple stain. So a simple stain means we're just gonna stain it blue or pink or purple, just the stain. 
Uh, next week, we're going to gram same. We'll differentiate between gram positive and gram negative. I'll go over that today, time permitting, so you know what that is. That's going to really help you determine um, the structure of the bacteria. So staining, dyes are used to create contrast by imparting color. All right, and um, everyone loves chemistry in here? No. <laughs> but just basic chemistry. All right, so in here, we're just going to use the, um, the premise, the positive and negative attract. All right. So anything with the same charge should basically repel things. Anything with opposite charges should um, come together. Is everyone familiar with what an ion means? Okay, so if I asked you short answer question, what is an ion? Nothing. Yeah, so it has a charge. Okay, perfect. All right, so an ion has a charge. Now. What happens when they get a positive and negative charge, they hook up? What's it called? You guys know what the salt? Yeah? You guys know what that is over there? <laughs> that big white rectangle? <laughs> oh, it's really scary. That's a periodic chart. All right, so just realize when things hook up, positive and negative, we have a salt. And we'll talk about that later on in the semester. So basic dyes are cationic. Got positive charge and negative charge. Positive, right? Positively charged. Oh, it's right there. Come before. <laughs> 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 All right. So positive scene. Surfaces of microbes are negatively charged and they attract basic dyes. So we're doing. Um, some basic dyes, and we're gonna be doing, if it works, we're doing some special stains. So, if a bacteria has a flagella, what is it able to do? Swim, move, nice. What if it has like a capsule? What if it has a coating around it? Protect it, all right, keeps it from drying out. And if I was a really, really hungry white blood cell, a macrophage, and I wanted to consume th something with a capsule on it, I would have to chew through that rubbery protein layer before I get to something. So it's very, very protective. So we're gonna be doing some uh, endospore staining, we'll do some capsule staining and some flagella staining, all right? And if it doesn't work, we have slides that we bought that are okay. We'll be doing that. Acidic dyes are anionic, right? negatively charged, so they're gonna attract something with a positive inside. And negative staining, microbes repel dye, the dark stains, stains the background. So we're gonna bring some negative stains on some endospores and some capsules. But we'll talk about that when we get to that lab. Not a big deal right now. All right, so today we're gonna to be doing a simple stain in lab, which just means a simple stain means you can take your pick of anything over there. Green, pink, purple, uh, whatever I think we have. Uh, not the one blue, we should have saffron in, crystal violet, um, whatever color you want. I'm just gonna do a basic stain and that'll just let us know the shape, all right? Does so everyone see the, in the middle there, that wood or cardboard looking thing with all those different bacteria shapes on it? So when we do a simple stain, we'll just be able to tell the shape, but like I said, we don't know whether it's gram positive or gram negative. We don't know the composition of the cell wall, but at least we can say, is it a rod shape? Is it a coccyx shape or whatever it happens to be? Now, for here, we're gonna be using differential stains. So that means I can differentiate between certain bacteria. A little bit more complicated, but a lot more information. So if I want to diagnose something or figure out how I want to treat it, if I know whether it's gram positive or gram negative, all right, acid fast or endospore stain. Now, last week, I talked about Lysol, and I said it kills 99.9% .9 of everything, but what's left? Endospores. So, if you were treating an infection and you knew that it had spores, all right, 
would you at least assume or agree that it might be more difficult to treat? Absolutely. Now, what if something's acid fast? What does that sound like? I don't know, but it sounds like it's probably harder to kill. Right, so we're looking at like, you guys heard of tuberculosis? Right, so it's got a very waxy coat. It's acid fast. So if we're staining something and we say, well, you know what, wouldn't gram stain? And even the uh, acid stain would work, but I was able to stain it with endospore stain. Right, that tell us what it is and how we would treat it. Now, structural stains reveal certain cell parts not revealed by dimensional methods. So, I said before, if it has a capsule or a flagella. If it's a capsule, it's encapsulated, probably harder to kill, right? And if it has a flagella, right, it can move towards something it likes or it can move away from something it doesn't like. So if it finds food or sugar or something that it likes, the flagella is gonna run towards it, right? If it has a change in pH or something's acidic or the environment isn't good, it's gonna tumble and move backwards. Everyone's familiar with a propeller on a boat? Mm -hmm. Right, so like on a boat, these flagella can move towards something or if they, they sense something they don't like, they'll just back up and move somewhere else. Right? That's a virulence factor. That's great if you're a bacteria. If it senses the immune system or whatever, it's gonna back up, it's gonna move away from it. Right. Yeah. So the PowerPoint should be embedded. They're not working here, but they should on uh, Brightspace. They should be up there, and I will um, download some of my YouTube videos. When we get into gram staining, I have it done, so you can watch it before you get here if you want. So I'm gonna do that. <clears throat> so here's staining examples. So methylene blue. It's a simple stain. It's just telling you the structure. I don't know whether it's gram positive or gram negative. This slide here, differential stains. This is extremely important. So is anyone here color blind? Or not color blind, color deficient? You color deficient? Green, red? Depends. Okay, that might be problematic. I'm not but sorry. We'll figure it <laughs> out. All right. I'll give you a pass on a couple of things. Maybe. Maybe. All right, so on this slide here, can you all agree that on the left half, it's purple? Bluish purple? It's yellow. All right, we'll do this though. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that close. Or that, I can't see that far away, but I'm for it. Do you need an eye, man? I can help you out, I can fix up with that. Yeah, that can be Sure. sure. Um, so there are, there's our gram positive. So we can all agree that that is purple. Later on today, we're gonna to get into the gram stain, right? And I will expect you by your midterm to know the gram stain procedure. Not that hard. I'll let you practice it, I promise. And then on the right, can we all agree that's pink or red? All right, so that is gram negative. And we'll go over the cell wall structure of that. So from now on, purple or gram positive, Pink or red are gram negative. Right. So if your checkbook is in the red, what does that mean? Negative. Broke. <laughs> or in debt. All right, so gram negative is in the red. Purple is positive. There you go. Right. There's idiot in capsule stain. So these have capsules. So we just stain the outside of that. So now I know that that bacteria has a capsule. I know it's gonna be a little bit harder to kill. Okay. Here's an acid fast stain. All right, so I know that's probably gonna have some kind of mycotic layer on it. It's gonna be a little bit harder to get some antimicrobials to. And my white blood cells are gonna have a little trouble getting rid of that. Okay. There's a flagella stain of proteus. Right. So what do you think that this is all the way around it. Peritritrus. Peri means around. All right. So what do you think that guy can do? It can move like hell. All right. It can just rotate, shift, pivot, whatever it wants to do. And there's a spore stain. So these are hard. They usually don't work out. But you'll see little dots. Now I know that bacteria is a spore former. 
I know it's going to be really hard to kill. Does anybody remember the only way I can kill something with a spore? Jesus. Autoclave, and what was the other one? Tindalization? Or I can just get a flamethrower, right? I can just burn the shit out of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's burn some stuff. All right. So I will be asking all of you some version of this question too. So I want to know the six eyes of culturing microbes. Right? So just kind of think about it for a second. Inoculation. So I want to inoculate something. So I'm going to just swab something. Okay? Induction of a sample into a container of media to produce a culture of observable growth. So if I swab something and I put it into a nutrient broth or on a plate, I should expect something to grow. Right? Well, in a minute, I'm going to grab a bunch of, I can find where I put them, a bunch of tubes and everything. And please realize, if I have a nutrient broth and it's clear, and something is growing in it a week later, should I expect that um, the viscosity of the color of that tube will probably change? Yes, it's going to get a little bit murky. Right? The issue becomes, if it changes color, or it gets a little bit denser, all right, I realize something's growing in it. But... Can I tell if everything in that container is alive? No. I know something's growing, but I don't know if it's all alive because bacteria, you can't take their respiration or pulse, right? I don't know if they're alive or dead. Okay. Then I want to isolate it. I separate one species from another. We're going to do that with a streak plate. You may not have heard that, but we'll go over a streak plate later. That's a uh, talent you guys are going to learn. Incubation, All right, we're gonna put a little womb under conditions that allow growth, about 37 degrees. Make sure it doesn't get too dry, get too hot, make it nice and comfortable. We're gonna inspect it. So how can I inspect, inspect that tree? What are some things I can do? Just scan it, right? And what do you think? Put it underneath the microscope. Thank you, yes. <laughs> I swear I can hear that. All right, and then I got information, identify it, and then I can determine what might be my, you know, it's my plan. Here's isolation. If an individual bacterial cell is separated from other cells and has space on a nutrient agar surface, we'll go into a monocell called a colony. All right, so theoretically, if I spread something out and I have one bacteria, and there's nothing around it, bacteria divide through binary fission. All right, so they just divide over and over again. So I should have a colony. So theoretically, if I swipe something from that colony, it should be exactly genetically the same as the original bacteria. All right, so if I ask you on your lab or on a test, what is colonization? Please do not tell me that it's when the indigenous people of a place <laughs> colonize the earth. I had somebody do that, and I saved the paper, and I gave the students a zero, and they went to the dean and said, well, I answered the question. I said, in the context of microbiology, I was not talking about colonization of the West. I was talking about colonization of a petri dish. Colony consists of one species. And when I, I can't make this stuff up. No, it sounds like something I would do. I like it. <laughs> I'm here for that. Who's going to be my favorite student? I can just see it. You're going to want to strangle me. <laughs> I'm going to be taser. <laughs> Kidding. Where am I? Yeah. Where am I? All right, so here, just showing you um, parent cell. These are other cells. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna streak them out. We're going to separate them. And then the singular bacteria should grow into these columns. And I'll draw it up on the board later. Okay, so this here is a streak plate. Right? So we're basically streaking something and we're doing what's called a serial dilution. Okay, I'm gonna maybe move the camera on the board and I'm gonna kind of go over it real quick so you have an idea of what we're doing. Hmm? 
I mean, I, I have this on my YouTube channel, but I'll just do it here so everyone can, can ask questions or whatever. Can everyone see, sort of, except for that one student in the eyes there? All right, so that is a Petri dish. All right, so I'm going to say, theoretically, I'm using Nutrient Auger or TSA. General purpose media, I'm not going to admit it anything. All right, so. So in theory, here's the plate. I'm going to take the cover off. I'm going to grab it's sterile. Well now it's not. But I'm gonna take something out here, I'm gonna swab it. Okay. And let's just say I swab it like this. Okay, so I just swab that plate. How many bacteria do you think I just put on there? Tens of thousands. Tens of ten thousands, that sounds good. Okay, now I'm gonna come over here and this is lit. All right, so I'm gonna take my inoculation loop. It's red hot. I hold it up. How many bacteria are now? Zero. So I'm going to take this, and it, there's none on it, and I swab it like that. How many bacteria do you think I have there? Doesn't matter. Thousand. I flame it again. It's red, hot, zero bacteria. Swab it through here. Let's just say I have 23. Oh, oh, I it. <laughs> 23. Realize again. Come over. And now you can do whatever you want with this. I'm gonna just draw it through here and kind of do that. Draw it through here and kind of do that. So as I swipe it through here, I picked up one or two came down here and hopefully I dropped one off here, I dropped one off here, one was here, one was here, and one was here. So now, next week when I come back, in theory, this should be from one bacteria, this should be from another bacteria, 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 and bacteria. These you won't see, all right, the swab lines you won't see. So in theory, I went from swabbing this, I had 10,000, sterilized it, zero, swiped it through here, about 1,000, came through here, maybe 23, sterilized it, and as I brought it through here, I dropped off one bacteria each, and if they're going through binary fission, in theory, these should be absolutely identical. All right. But, now what would happen if I had a mixed culture or I swabbed something from here? Do I know whatever's in that quadrant is one single bacteria? No. So in theory, when I go through here, there could be, oh sorry, there could be different bacteria that, that get deposited here singularly, and they could grow uh, on their own, okay? But the problem with that is they're gonna have different colonial morphology. I used that term last week. So colonial morphology means colony. And what does morphology mean? And I know I stood right here when I said it last week. Different shape and color. All right, so when we, during the cool